Hello, I'm Maria Hall Brown, and this is LA Currents. Fearless, tireless, political activist, civil rights icon, schools, a labor institute, housing complexes, even an area of Boyle Heights all bear her name. I am truly honored to be joined today by Dolores Huerta. So nice to have you here. I cannot tell you how delighted it is that we are all thrilled you are here. Well, thank you for having me. You know, I realized that Los Angeles actually has a critical component to your work even to begin with. I mean, Fred Ross and the Chicano movement in Boyle Heights, how did that impact you and getting what you wanted to get across done started? Well, actually, meeting Fred Ross Sr. Um, changed my life. I was a school teacher, but after meeting Fred Ross Sr. and he showed me pictures of what they had done in Los Angeles back in the 50s, you know, bringing in street lights, uh, sidewalks, gutters, clinics, you know, getting representation, electing the first Latino uh, to the city council of Los Angeles, Edroy Ball, who then became the first congressman that went to Washington, D.C. Uh, from, uh, from the state of California. That changed my entire life. So I quit teaching and became an organizer, thanks to Fred Roth Sr., and, and Fred Ross Sr., you know, for those who don't know exactly what he was doing here in Los Angeles, he actually started a very strong Chicano movement. Yes, and there was an organization called the Community Service Organization, and I know many of your viewers are, are going to remember that organization, uh, and that was one of their first projects that they did, was to get someone to represent them on the city council, as I mentioned, Ed Roy Ball. But Fred Ross Sr. is the one that showed them how to organize, how to make that happen. Did he tell you that you had the power and the capability of doing it too, or was it just seeing what he was doing kind of gave you ideas? Well, actually, the way that Fred Ross Sr. taught us to organize from the ground up, and uh, the, the, the magic about that type of organizing is that you really don't know who the leaders are going to be. Oh, interesting. And then when they show up to do the work, and that's when the leaders emerge, and of course, I was so uh, enamored with the idea of getting people together and, and uh, knowing that they that showing people that they have the power to change things. Mm -hmm. And so I just gave it my all. I, you know, I decided to become a full-time organizer. And, and and not only myself, but as you know, Cesar Chavez and many, mm -hmm. many other uh, leaders have come out of that uh, type of organizing, the grassroots or organizing. Well, and that's where all the difference is made. Um, I know there were some critical you know, things that happened when you came back to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were achieving some great success. You were getting some really important things done, um, and you had made some very dear friends. You were with Robert F. Kennedy at the Ambassador Hotel um, on stage, and you had his support just moments before the tragedy of his murder. I know that affected you, uh, and I know that hurt a lot, and I know that kind of almost took the wind out of your sails. What did you say to yourself, and how did you rally from that to get moving forward? Well, Robert, uh, Senator Robert Kennedy was a person that really believed in helping uh, the people that needed the, the help the most. You know, Bedford Stuyvesant, that, that's what he did in New York City uh, with, uh, in App Appalachia uh, when he met with the people there, the people, the poor people of that area. And of course, when he came out uh, to work with the farm workers movement, uh, he really believed in, in helping poor people and helping and empowering poor people also. Uh, so. Uh, we know that when we lost him, as Gloria Steinem said in the documentary, Dolores, I recommend that people see that yes. documentary by Peter Brown, it's very good. Yes. But uh, Gloria Steinem, uh, she had a very strong statement. She said, uh, she thought, she said, I never thought I would see that we would lose the future. Okay? Mm -hmm. Robert Kennedy was the future. But we know uh, because of Robert Kennedy and people like him, like Dr. King and others, that he, they would have wanted us to continue organizing. And not, I know a lot of people got, became very cynical after Senator Kennedy was assassinated, but we know that our mission is to keep on organizing, keep on empowering people, knowing that we can, we can build and create a society where we have social justice, social, uh, and I would say economic justice also. How old were you at that point in, in your efforts? Well, uh, I was, uh, I, when uh, Robert Kennedy, I was uh, 48 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, I just, I just think about all the remarkable work you've done mm -hmm. and such a vast array of geographic areas that you've impacted and in, in national, international. But, you know, 
Does LA still hold a place in your heart when it comes to who you are and what you do? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I worked a lot in Los Angeles when I worked with the community service organization mm -hmm. uh, because we had, uh, this, this was the main headquarters of that uh, organization. And so I worked right here, right across the street from Roosevelt High School. That's where we had our office. And that organization is still, uh, is still alive today. It's amazing. It was started, I think, back in 1952. And uh, they still have people here that are working in, in the community. And out of that organization, the Community Service Organization, or CSO, uh, the, both Cesar Chavez and I, this is where we learned our organizing skills. And, but then we decided to start the Farm Workers Union because the CSO became a statewide organization and uh, throughout the Central Valley and Imperial Valley and even parts of uh, the San Joaquin Valley, there are a lot, lot of farm workers. And this is, we decided that, uh, but the CSO uh, would not support us to do the farm worker organizing. And so that's when Cesar and I left. Oh, I and then we started the United Farm Workers. Okay, so I know you've been, no interview conversation mm -hmm. or even passing, mm -hmm. you know, encounter with mm -hmm. you does not hold, you know, that phrase, si si puede. Mm -hmm. But my question is, was that something that you planned to say or was that just something that you reacted to and just it caught on like wildfire? Did you know well, I mean, you stated the way it was, actually. Yeah. It was a reaction. And Cesar Chavez had uh, done his second 25-day uh, water-only fast uh, in Arizona. And when I was organizing some of the local leadership there and asking them to support uh, what Cesar was doing because they had passed a law that if farm workers went on strike, they could go to jail. If anybody said boycott anything, you could also go to jail. And so we were organizing people to try to overturn that law that the governor had already signed. And when I talked to some of these leaders, they told me, oh, in Arizona, you can't do anything like that. In California, you can, but in Arizona, you can't, or no se puede. Mm -hmm. And then my response to them, it was a spontaneous response saying, si se puede, yes, we can, it can be done. Mm -hmm. Were you surprised that it caught on and it has become the phrase that follows you and is on banners and shirts and, you know, every possible surface that there is? <laughs> and a political party in Spain, by the way, this yes. is called the Podemos party. Yes, I think I'm, I think I'm gratified because it, it is such a strong message because in Spanish, it not only means, yes, we can, it means, yes, I can. So it's got like a double message. So yeah, it is a very strong theme. Well, you mentioned political party. Obviously, you know, someone, someone kind of took it and shifted it slightly in his campaign with, you know, President Obama. And I know that you both have had little conversations about that. Did he ever admit that he just sort of said, oh, I'm going to take this great idea and run with it? <laughs> well, actually, when I met uh, President Obama, uh, he said to me, I stole your slogan. <laughs> and I said to him, yes, you did. <laughs> Well, with all of the work that you've done, obviously, you know, you started with farm workers' rights and rights in general and women's rights, et cetera. But where are we now? What are you, what are you focused on now? Where do you feel as if things have really changed and uh, accomplishments have been made? And where have we fallen short? Oh, well, we have a lot to do. As we know, we're at a critical moment in our society. And uh, when we talk about women's rights, actually, uh, today, uh, uh, Senator Schumer is going to take up the Equal Rights Amendment on the floor of the Senate. For a procedural vote, uh, we don't know whether we'll, they'll be able to take it to have a, a vote, but a lot of women think, oh, we already have our constitutional rights. No, we don't. And if the Equal Rights Amendment is passed, then it, it will be part of the Constitution of the United States of America that women, we have equal rights as men. Uh, we know that we have to do a lot more work for racial equality uh, to make sure that that happens, and of course, economic equality, all the people that are working at trying to organize Starbucks and Amazon and some of these other places are, are you know, they win their elections, but then the employers refuse to bargain with them. Right. So we have a long way to go. And of course, with the farm workers, you know, right now they're really threatened with floods and everything. And I like to say about the farm workers, you know, farm workers, uh, when we compare them as essential workers, we have policemen that are essential workers, firemen that are essential workers, but farm workers don't get the kind of benefits and salaries, wages, that our other essential workers receive. And when we think about who are the most essential workers, I think we have to say, <laughs> of course, that the farm workers are because they're the ones that feed us. 
And we're also doing work with the unhoused people right now in the Antelope Valley, our foundation, the Deloitte Fuerte Foundation. And of course, we're all working on, on education. We have a youth program and of course on the environment. It seems unfathomable. I mean, someone in my position, and I'm sure that you've had multiple people who in, my, in the same situation, it seems unfathomable that you have been able to do what you have been able to do. And when I said you were tireless and fearless, you are tireless and fearless. Do you, what do you think when you stop and look at what you've done? Are you satisfied or are you just agitated and want to keep going? Do you realize the impact you've made or are you desperate to make more? Well, we know we have a lot of people that we have to reach uh, so that they can understand that they have the power to improve our society. And a lot of people don't realize that. And this is why our democracy is threatened right now. So my message uh, as I go around speaking to everyone and the work that we're doing with my foundation in the five counties of the Central Valley to, to say to people, no, you have the power and you are the only ones they can really improve all of these challenges that we have right now, that we can face the challenges. And, but people have to understand that, and of course it comes down to voting. And it comes down to uh, getting good representation, people that will actually go use the power of their offices once they're elected to go out there and, and help people and not to take advantage of people. How did you convince yourself that you had the, I know your mother was a huge impact, uh, influence, excuse me, and, but how did you know that you had the, the stamina to just stand up and stand with and speak out? Well, this is what I learned from Fred Ross Sr. because mm -hmm. he's the one that taught me that. I was actually a, a shy person. I was a, a teacher, as I mentioned before. But I think every single person, if they realize that, that number one, our democracy can only function if every single person participates. And that means, yes, going to your local school board meeting to make sure that what they're teaching is what you want them to teach. And when I say that, I'm talking about ethnic studies, labor studies, gender studies, you know, women's studies, civic engagement, and making sure that those kinds of very essential lessons are being taught to our children, you know, to our students, and, uh, and, and then going to our city councils. And I, 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 we had a, a press conference uh, today with uh, uh, Karen Bass and celebrating the fact that they're building these units, housing units for the unhoused people. And when you see that that's happening, then that really, uh, it kind of uh, justifies, a, a, I, I might say, it affirms the fact that we have to elect good people mm -hmm. like, like the mayor, Karen Bass of Los Angeles, that are committed uh, to solve one of the biggest challenges that we have right now is making sure that the unhoused have a place to live. And these are things that we, the people, and that's, you know, our constitution starts with those words, we, the people, right? We, the people, have the power to make these happen. And Good you, things happen. And you have on, on so many things. But do you ever just sit and relax? What do you do to enjoy being Dolores? What do you do to just calm down and let the world be okay for a couple minutes while you're not working? <laughs> Well, uh, you know, spending time with my family, uh, members of my family, uh, listening to music. I love music, dancing whenever I get a chance to, yeah. and enjoying the outdoors. Also, I think is very important that we have to remember that they give, give back to nature and, again, help with the environment so that we can uh, continue to have a planet to live on. I think maybe people don't realize that, you know, it has been a, it has been a challenge because you are the mother of 11. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know that there's been some heartache there about being able to spend some time, but you had a great support system. But I, I thought about this, and I don't know if this is even an untoward thing to say, but when you're doing this work, I would imagine for a lot of it, you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. Was that, does, I mean, I can't even fathom that as a woman in an era in which women had to, you know, really step out you talking about the issues that you really wanted people to understand, and then you physically, you know, being in, that must have been an interesting time. Well, you know, the one thing about when you become an activist, I want to say this, especially to women out there, and when you become an activist, uh, you, the issues that you're working on, they kind of take prominence, and you devote a lot of your time and energy and your mental energy, and you don't have, you don't have time to think about your own personal issues, okay? <laughs> you know, they become a, minimal. And uh, a lot of times our personal, our personal issues are resolved by, the, by themselves. Mm -hmm. but, so when you focus on 
and making the world a better place and empowering people, getting more people involved uh, to make a better place. I think, yeah, I think that really helps with whatever you're doing. And, and as women, we always have to uh, fight to uh, get people, uh, not, uh, just, oh, we have to fight so that we can have universal health, uh, daycare, right? like universal health care and universal education. You know, we need this as women because we need more women in civic life. Mm -hmm. We have seen what great women leaders that, that we have right now, but we know that we need more. And I know that your daughter, you know, runs a foundation and so some really wonderful things. But what would you want women to tell their daughters? What would you want, you know, women that maybe are at a stage in their life in which their choices have been made, but they're looking at the young women in front of them? What would you want me to tell my daughter? I would uh, say to your daughter, uh, and if you could say to her, number one, get her involved. Take her to marches, take her to picket lines, take her to protests, uh, take her to uh, the Sacramento, to the legislature, so she, she can see how that works, and uh, get, uh, get her involved in uh, signing petitions, registering people to vote. I think the best way to teach is to have them participate and to learn. This is the way that all of my children learn. All of my children grew up in the movement, so they're all activists. And regardless of, my, one of my sons is an, is an attorney, another one's a doctor, I have a doctor who's a teacher, another one works on the environment, you know, a nurse. But they were all involved civically because they started when they were kids, passing out leaflets, going door to door, uh, asking people to register to vote. And so the best uh, lessons that we can give them is to involve them at an early age. And they will remember that. They will remember they were on that march. And I know we've had a lot of marches recently for women's rights and for civil rights and and uh, so they, they need to have a sense of their power and to know that they can, they can make things happen. And so how would you envision the, the best future? I mean, and do we have the leaders in place right now to create that future of fairness and equality? I mean, I know that we are definitely in, you mentioned Mayor Bass, but you know, we're in a transition period. We've had some trials and tribulations with a worldwide pandemic and political upheaval and you know, a lot, but where are we? Are we in a good spot? Do you think we have promise on the horizon? Oh, I think so, but I think it takes a lot of us to make sure that we can stop the fascism that is infecting our society. And the leaders are out there in the community, people that we don't even know. And so when we, when we do this grassroots community organizing, the leaders step up, because at the, at the moment they may not know that they're a leader, but once you get them involved and you get them active, then the leadership just sprouts up. Uh, this is the magic of doing grassroots organizing, and this is why I'm, I have devoted my life to, to doing that type of organizing. When you go into a community, often you don't know who the leaders are going to be, but when you start making an action plan, and then they step up to do the work, then the, the leadership is, is developed and evolved. That's why I really love to see uh, commu community organizers like Aaron Bass, like Barack Obama, uh, people like that, when they get into office because they, they have those, those liaisons and those ties with the community and they know what the issues are. And I do believe, you know, with the grassroots, I mean, we even have two new council members here in the LA City Council, you know, that literally did a grassroots campaign. They didn't have the political background that one would think you necessarily need, but they did have the intelligence, the capability, and the drive to do that. So grassroots efforts do lead to grassroots, uh, you know, change. And development, yeah. And, and I think a lot of times, I say, and I say this as an organizer, that often funders, they will fund programs, but they won't fund organizing. But like in our organization, the Lord for the Foundation, we have various programs. We have a youth program. We have an education program. Uh, we have our uh, civic engagement program. Uh, we have a program, as I mentioned, uh, with people that are unhoused yeah. uh, up in the Owl Valley where we provide hot meals for people, make sure that they have blankets, they have shoes, that they have the necessities that they need. So if you have a lot of people that are involved, then you can do all of these different types of programs. And you haven't stopped, and you're still going. You have no intention of stopping, relaxing, taking a vacation, going on a cruise. <laughs> well, I do hope to take a, a vacation this summer. Okay. So, yeah, and definitely I intend to keep on going. And you know when you introduced me, you used, you used the word icon? Mm -hmm. Well, my youngest son, Ricardo, he says, Mom, you're not an icon, you're an I can. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we have to do. We, we have, have to change all the signs <laughs> in the studio right now. Absolutely. All right. So 
I have the good fortune of being with you and I have the good fortune of sharing this time with you. But if I was to take you out and introduce you to an elementary school child that maybe has not had the good fortune of learning about your life, how would I introduce you? Who would you want to be known as and for if I, you know, in the very simplistic, purest terms? Well, I would like to be introduced as an organizer and a person who tells people and convinces people that they have power. And it's really interesting. Even when I talk to uh, elementary school children, uh, I was with a group of second graders about a week ago, and I say to them, and I like to end my talks, and I say to people, I ask them two questions. Uh, and well, the first question I, I ask them is, who's got the power? And I want the answer to say, we've got the power. And then we say, what kind of power? We say, people power. And even little elementary school students they understand that. They understand that. And when I say, who's got the power? They say, we've got the power. <laughs> what kind of power? People power. And this is the one thing, to keep our democracy alive, we have to say to every single person, you not only have the power, and I'm going to quote Robert Kennedy. We mentioned him when he was assassinated. And he said, we have obligations and responsibilities to help our fellow citizens, okay? And so as citizens of this, and, and residents of this country, even if you're not a citizen, we have an obligation to keep democracy alive. And the only way that we can do this is by electing progressive leadership in our country. And of course, to do that, we've got to do the voter registration, the voter education, and get people to become citizens. And yes, we all have a responsibility to vote. And making sure that we're all good to each other. I think Absolutely. that one of the things that you have really emphasized is that there is no other, because that's the scary part is when we create the other instead of the us. Yeah, we have to remember that we are one human family. And I also like to add to my lectures is that we have, we, rem we have to remember that we are one human race and that our human race began in Africa. Mm -hmm. So that means we are all Africans of different shades and colors. And if we could put that argument to rest, then we could start looking at some of the other issues that we have to solve. Well, I cannot tell you what a joy it is for us to have this time with you and your attachment to Los Angeles. Do you have plans to come back anytime soon? Oh, absolutely. I, I, I come here very often, actually, and I have uh, two of my children that actually live here in Los Angeles. Okay. Well, then we would love to have, uh, you know, be aware of wherever you are at any time because to know that everything is possible if there is just that drive and intent and that purity of willingness to do it, I think is an imperative message that you have been able to share and your legacy is pretty profound. So I cannot thank you enough. Yes, and I think it takes all of the sectors of our society in the, you know, we uh, celebrated uh, the uh, housing project with my name on it here. And it took the, the private equity people the people that have the, the, the money, the resources uh, to actually partner uh, with the government and the other people that are doing ha ha housing uh, to make it happen. And it does take all of us together, working together, uh, to make sure that we can solve these really, really big issues that we have right now. And we know that the United States is the most powerful country in the world, and what we do affects the world. So if we can think about that, and you know, this big responsibility that we have as individuals, as citizens, that we also have to give our share to make a better world. Well, thank you for making it better in, as, as what you've done in our world so far. So, and I look forward to seeing what else you're capable of doing because I'm sure it has no, absolutely no restrictions, no bounty, whatever. Well, I think it's not what, what I'm doing, but we, we can uh, organize people uh, so that they can actually do the work. So it's not about me. My, my job as an organizer is to convince other people again that they have not only the power, but the responsibility uh, to come, in, come into the movement. All of us working together, we can make a, a better world. All right, I'm sure the answer is your children's homes. What's your favorite place to go in LA? Well, I love to go to plays. Oh, me too. I love to go to plays. I love to go to some of the museums, some of the gardens that are here in Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Obviously, the Hollywood Bowl mm -hmm. <laughs> is a great place to go to. Yeah, there are so many, so many places, and probably so many places that I have not been to uh, in Los Angeles. So 
Yes, it is a, a really great city. Well, thank you. Thank you again for everything that you do. And I hope that I have the opportunity to be in your presence again. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap on this LA Currents.